Okay, so we're gonna go over um, some of the issues with sampling and some things that can happen that cause samples to sort of not be ideal. Um, first off would be sort of a non-representative sample. So if say we're wanting to have our population be all of South Seattle College students, um, this class would not be a representative sample because you'd have an online class of students that is a very particular subsection of the population. Um, you could say, well, let's take some students from all the statistics classes. Um, and again, this might not be a representative sample because, uh, for example, we have a very large professional technical program at South and none of those students are taking statistics or most of them are not. So you would be missing out on a bunch of uh, the population that isn't, doesn't, isn't required to take statistics. Um, if your population was, say, uh, all of academic transfer division at South Seattle College, you know, then would, would a bunch of statistics students be representative? You know, maybe um, who's being left out? Um, people in the early education program don't need statistics. Um, people in STEM often don't need statistics. So again, engineers, maybe. Um, computer science majors wouldn't be taking statistics. So you would be missing out on a bunch of people. Um, and again, you might end up with sort of a non-representative sample. Or like, let's say our, we were surveying bus riders. If we just surveyed them in the morning, we'd be missing all the evening bus riders, for example. Or if we just surveyed a certain particular bus route, we'd be missing all the other bus routes. Okay, um, a non-random sample, that's, you know, uh, if we are using convenient sampling, you are oftentimes not getting a representative sample, so and it's not random. So, um, for example, if I was doing a surveying people about their politics, political views, and I surveyed my family, I mean, chances are a lot of the members of my family have the same political views as I, and so we wouldn't have a random sample in that case. Um, sample sizes being too small, um, you know. It's hard to say what too small of a sample size is. Um, you know, oftentimes 30 people is a good sample, and or 50, 30 or 50 people. Um, but if we're talking about the population of the United States, then 30 or 50 people is not a good sample. Um, if you're talking about, you know, all the statistics students at South Seattle College, probably 20 or 30 would be a good sample of that population because there's probably 200 statistics students. And if you took 30 or 40 of them, that's a good size sample. Um, what you want to stay away from is, you know, a sample size of you know, five or six, because you, you know that's could could lean one way or the other, and, and look look like the whole population has uh, one view when really it's just these six people. Um, Self-selected participation in a survey. So any survey where the person being surveyed gets to decide whether they want to participate in it or not. Uh, this would be any kind of online survey. This is this is problematic because you know who goes to a who goes to rate my professor to rate their professor people who are either generally really happy with their instructor or generally really unhappy with their instructor so you get this kind of mm, split um, participation and, and the people who are sort of semi happy or, or you know not very technologically savvy aren't even going to go there at all um, so self selected participation. Surveys are not um, are not usually good, and then any kind of survey where you're giving, where the participant is being given an incentive. So, um, if they are being rewarded to participate in the survey, that will cause issues with um, potentially with their ability to answer honestly or to to be a to be a, to be a good sample. Um, and these are not the only issues, but these are some common issues that occur. And then another thing that we could look at are issues with surveying. Um, so when the survey is conducted by someone who has the opportunity to gain advantage from the survey. So when it's a self-serving survey. So if um, I am surveying you and I'm like, well, how do you like this class? You know, <laughs> it's, um, it, it's it's the results of the survey 
ideally the survey would be being done by someone else. Um, it's one of the reasons why when we do teacher evaluations, the teacher is supposed to leave the room and they're supposed to be anonymous so that it doesn't have an effect. Um, another example would be sort of um, products. You know, if, if, if you're trying to get people to determine whether they like product A, is it Pepsi versus Coke? You know, and, and Coke is doing the survey and everywhere behind me it says Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola. Um, most people are gonna sort of choose the Coke option over the Pepsi option um, because it's sort of, that's, uh, it creates a tendency to lean towards one rather than the other. Um, or, you know, medical surveys are often done, um, sponsored by the drug companies and they are looking for certain results um, and you have to, and, and, and as a consumer, one would want to be careful of, are these benefits real or are these benefits there because that's what the company who sponsored the survey wanted the results to look like. Um, in the surveying, you have to also look out for biased or leading questions. Um, you know, uh, a way of saying, you know, rate your professor on a scale from, you know, you know, poor, to good, or poor being a zero and good being a five, or that's fine, or sort of a biased question would be like, oh, did you like your instructor? Or, or um, did you, uh, you know, are you happy with this product? So like, just the way the question can be asked can lead towards bias. Um, who's asking the question also can lead towards bias. If, that's again that self-survey, self-serving survey, or biased or leading questions. Um, improper results. So this happens a lot. Um, you'll say like, oh, 20% of 48 people. Well, 20% of 48 is maybe 9.6. So you can't have 20% of 48 because that would be 9.6 people. Um, so, you know, that doesn't make sense. Or if you were um, estimating the population and the number of people at a, at a march or a rally and you said, oh, there were 200,362 people. You know, that's, that's too precise for an estimate that, that you, you, would, you would expect that there would be some rounding 200,500 people or hundreds of thousands of people. You wouldn't get down to the 62 people. Um, graphs can sometimes be misleading um, by changing the scale on a graph you can make things look um, like there's a lot of growth even though you, know, you have this widespread trying to get my hands in the, in the camera a widespread and it maybe that that distance is only one <laughs> you know so it looks like it grew a lot even though it's only going up by one that would be a misleading graph um, Causality claims, so that's sort of claiming that because this is true, it follows that that is true. So because um, uh, I'm stuck, <laughs> because. Sorry, I, 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 my, the example left my mind. Um, confounding issues is when two or more things are sort of, again, put together as if they're the same thing. So, um, you know, students are doing better in their statistics class because there's more tutoring available on campus. Um, so that kind of gets into causality as well. So the survey could show that students are doing better in statistics and there could be more tutoring on campus. And those two things may or may not be related. So when I put them together, it confounds them. When I said students are doing better in statistics because there is more tutoring available on campus, that's a causality thing. That's saying they're doing better in statistics because there's additional tutoring available. Um, so again, let me kind of try, to set, try that again. We have a survey that shows students are doing better in statistics, and we have data that shows we have more tutoring available on campus. 
those are separate things and putting them together um, is confounding. Saying that one caused the other is, is causality. Um, those two are, are hard to kind of separate and kind of um, often go together, confounding and causality. Um, but basically you're saying you know why something has happened or you're taking two separate issues and putting them together. Okay, so those are issues with surveying. Um, the, the most common ones are the self-serving survey, the biased and leading questions, and then improperly giving or displaying your results. And again, back to sampling, you know, the most common thing is a non-representative sample or a non-random sample or a sample size that's too small. Um, and then, you know, th those can be caused by, or some of that stuff can be caused by a self-selecting participation, um, mail-in surveys or online surveys, or some kind of survey where you get some kind of type of participation incentive. You get a reward for completing the survey. All right, that's it. Thanks. Let's see. Pause. Stop.